Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins, a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and sacred scriptures, along with information on topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is brought to you by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Tom Rudnicki on prison ministry. We will also look at the life of St. Vincent Ferrer, as well as reflections on the readings for this second Sunday of Easter and Sunday of Divine Mercy. That and more coming up on Wineskins. In our current issue, Father Nick Shorey, Director of Evangelization for the Diocese of Youngstown, will share some thoughts on that same subject. Good morning and welcome on this Divine Mercy Sunday. It has been a number of years now since St. John Paul II initiated what we now know as Divine Mercy Sunday. And what I'd like to share with you today is a very practical story that I ran into that has to do with mercy. As many of you, or certainly some of you may know from knowing me, I teach on the faculty of Mercy College, which is responsible for the nursing school in relation to Mercy College of Ohio out of Toledo, but we're based at St. E's. I have taught there since we started back maybe some 13 years ago, and among the courses that I teach is medical ethics. And as we start that course, one of the questions that we take or one of the issues that we take are the, the, the values both for the, the School of Nursing and St. E's Hospital, and they actually are the same values. So we talk about what values are. We talk about specifically what the values of the hospital and therefore the college are, the School of Nursing, and how that applies to the students that I have with respect to how is that going to affect their nursing skill, their treatment of people, especially those patients that may be very, very difficult patients to take care of for whatever reason. One particular day, we were talking about the compassion, we were talking about mercy, and I asked the students, who are the people in your life that you would say are persons who demonstrate mercy, that demonstrate mercy in how they treat others and their attitude toward life? Who are some of these people? And we began to go around the room, and they, they came up with different persons that they knew and different situations that they faced, and were able to articulate you know, fairly well what they felt were examples of people who emulated mercy. And as we were doing this, a young man in the class raised his hand, and he said, I think that we are mercy. And so when I pushed him a little on what he meant, what he meant was that the students themselves were good examples of people who demonstrate mercy. And so I asked him to elaborate on that a little bit more. And basically what he said was, He said, Father, as you know, he said, this is not an easy course. This is not an easy thing to accomplish within a few years of your life. And for the most part, that's very, very true. If you know anybody who's gone through a very demanding course such as nursing, you'll know what we're talking about. For the most part, you lose control of your life for at least a couple years. Family is affected. Your kids are affected. Your in-laws are affected. Spouses are affected. It is not an easy journey. And what this young man was saying was that we demonstrate mercy unto each other. And we do so when we see that someone in the school of nursing is having a particular time understanding a concept. Someone in the school of nursing is having a particular issue at home. Some kind of tragedy has struck in their life. Somehow, the pressure of being in the school of nursing is really getting to them. And what he was saying was that we, when you look at us, When you look at us as a class, we actually do demonstrate mercy toward each other far more than sometimes we realize. And I thought that was really a good insight because that is very, very true, that seldom do we look perhaps within our own grouping to see the demonstration of something like mercy. How often do we see ourselves as the demonstrator of mercy in relationship to our family, in relationship to my friends? And I would dare say, how often do we, as Catholics, demonstrate mercy to each other in the sense of our parishes, in the sense of what we face, in the issues of reconfiguration and and evangelization? Are we ready and willing to demonstrate mercy to ourselves 
very often we're very hard on each other in our refusal to get along, in our refusal to cooperate, in our refusal to collaborate. And many of the things that we face in reconfiguration and evangelization are not easy. They're very difficult obstacles when it comes to what we're going to do with worship sites or how we're going to change schedules or changing something that we have done for many years. And now all of a sudden, because of this or because of that, that particular action or practice has to change. And sometimes we fail to realize that for many people, that is a very, very difficult thing. And the need to be merciful and understanding, the need to be compassionate, is a very important virtue in what we, what we are willing to demonstrate. We oftentimes are very willing to demonstrate the virtue in people far beyond our inner circle. You know, it's easy to extend mercy to that individual or to that group, but we fail to oftentimes demonstrate the virtue among our own brothers and sisters, within our family, within our friends and dare say I, within the church itself. So hopefully on this Divine Mercy Sunday, while we may question ourselves as to who are some of the people that really demonstrate mercy, can you include yourself, and can you include yourself or others because we do it not just with those who are outside of our circle, but those within, that the demonstration of mercy to the closest among us is just as important as is the demonstration of mercy to far beyond that circle. For Wineskins, I am Father Nick Shorey. This coming Tuesday, the Church celebrates the Feast of St. Vincent Ferrer. To tell us more is Brother Dominic Calabro from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. The zealous Dominican preacher Vincent Ferrer lived in one of the most turbulent periods in the history of the Church. It was the time of the Western Schism and the residence of the Pope at Avignon, France. Vincent was born in Spain and entered the Dominicans at the age of 15 and was ordained a priest in the year 1378. All his life he felt that he was called to carry the gospel not only to Christians, but to Jews, the Muslims, and the heretical sects at the time. He was called to Avignon to serve as the official theologian to Pope Benedict XIII as well as his confessor. St. Vincent preached not only in Spain, France, but also in Italy, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. He is reputed to have received the gift of tongues and is renowned as a healer. During the preaching mission at Lyon, France in 1404, he organized a large number of people who accepted his teaching and followed him wherever he preached. They were called the penitents. They dressed in black and white colors of the Dominican habit and carried the staff of a pilgrim. The high point of St. Vincent's preaching mission was between the years 1412 and 1419. He died in France while on a preaching mission in which he tried to put an end to the Hundred Years' War between France and England. He was canonized in 1455 and highly venerated to this day, not only in Spain, Latin America, but also in the Philippines. The opening prayer of the Mass states that God called St. Vincent Ferrer to preach the gospel of the Last Judgment. He urged his hearers to perform acts of repentance in view of the final days practice that is still relevant today. Vincent called himself Christ's legate, and he believed that the Blessed Virgin had obtained from her divine son the assurance that the world would exist until the mission of St. Dominic and St. Francis of Assisi would be complete. He felt that in view of the increasing corruption of morals and the large number of conversions yet to be made, God had given him the special vocation and mission to preach on the four last things. Many consider him a second John the Baptist, preaching penance unto conversion. St. Vincent's sermons on the coming of the angel of the apocalypse made a strong impression in those days of schism and moral decadence. In fact, up to the present time, the artists in Spain portray St. Vincent with wings of the angel of the apocalypse. His preaching was accompanied by numerous miracles and prophecies. St. Vincent's counsel is still applicable today, especially with the following statement. Each sinner in your congregation should feel moved as though you were preaching to him alone. Your words should sound as if they were coming not from a proud or angry soul, but from the charitable and loving heart. This way of preaching has proven profitable to congregations, for an abstract discourse on the virtues and vices hardly inspired anyone to those who listen. 
For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. Joining me now is Tom Rudnicki, who is the coordinator for the Ohio Penitentiary System for the Diocese of Youngstown in prison ministry. And Tom, it's such a pleasure to have you on Wineskins today. Well, thank you, Father, for having me. You know, prison ministry is something that I would consider kind of a a new ministry in the church today. While it's probably been going on for centuries, it's been more in the forefront for us today. Before we get into our discussion about it, tell us a little bit about how and why you got involved in prison ministry. Well, I had a uh, friend of mine, Anthony Kobach, who was involved in ministry with Father Shorey for several years, and they needed some assistance. I had been a Eucharistic minister over at Holy Family for a number of years, and they wanted people to bring Eucharist to the prisoners over there. So he put an ad in the, in the bulletin over there, Holy Family. I had no Anthony from uh, Christian News' parish activities over at Holy Family. So I got involved that way, and he took me and mentored me for a while, and I got involved. Yeah, that's how I got involved. Well, we know that there's a lot of people throughout the Diocese of Youngstown that are involved in prison ministry, right. not just in one particular prison or jail, but in all of those confinement facilities. Correct. In your experience, why do people want to get involved in prison ministry first? That's my first question. Well, I think it's service to others. It's not an easy ministry out by any means, especially it, it can be a little upsetting to people coming into the maximum security prison, the have penitentiary there for people. It's not for everybody, certainly. I think we look at for the least of our brethren. We want to do service to the least of our brethren, and, and those are the type of people that we get. It's a difficult, at least at our facility, it's a little bit difficult for people to adjust to it. But once you get in there uh, and you see that amazingly smiling faces when you come to give them the Eucharist, people that are in, in that facility in their cells for 23 hours a day. So it's segregation to the you know maximum level, really. I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. And there are some people probably that are listening that feel, why would you ever want to give any ministry to someone who's incarcerated? I would imagine that's something you might hear from time to time. And that's unfortunately a sentiment that might be out there. What would you say to someone who says that in a pastoral way in response to that? Well, well, we have to take our lead from our our Pope Francis. He's encouraging the prison ministry. And also our bishop has been very active helping us over there and getting us what we need to move forward. I do get comments like, you sure you want to do that ministry, even from uh, different people in our parish? So it's not for everybody, uh, certainly, but we have to do for the least of our brethren and bring Christ to them. I've had some of the most uh, spiritual masses that we've ever had. You know, I've been to the the Shrine of the Magic Conception and had mass there, but I'm telling you, these masses we have there are more spiritual. The people want to be there. They want us to be there, and Christ is alive there. Let's talk about that whole element of faith, because, you know, when we think of someone who might be incarcerated, we think, well, they're faithless, but they obviously have some kind of faith level that was instilled in them from an early age, most likely. What is the faith experience and spiritual experience beyond that that you have with, in a personal relationship with those prisoners? Well, many of them are actually converts to the faith. We have six right now in, at the penitentiary that are in RCIA, and the bishop will be coming in April to baptize and confirm those two. So a lot of these are new to the faith. Although, as we many, see many even in our parish, some of our strongest Catholics are converts to the faith. They are searching for something. They find that. So many of these are converts to the faith. Uh, we have a very diverse population there, probably 20% African-American. Hispanic, and the rest would be Caucasian, but it is a more diverse uh, population than we normally see in our diocese. So it's it's a diverse group. Uh, Yeah, some come uh, from from childhood, and a lot of times they naturally, for whatever reason, fall away from the church. And this is an opportunity. Once they see us coming into the pods there, and say, oh, well, you know, I'm a, I was a Catholic, and, and their faith is regenerated. And a lot, a lot of times, it's for the, their friends and family. A lot of times, it's their grandmother that had a strong faith. I have a num- number of people that are in their life imprisonment where they have a, a grandmother that they talk to every week that is very spiritual, that brings faith to them. So their fa- there's faith. Sometimes they've, they've fallen off the path, but their faith is still strong based on their family. A lot of times it's their family. And, and new converts, of course, it's the priest 
and the lay people that have come to minister to them and brought them faith. And we we have some very strong uh, believers there, believe me. Let's talk (laughs) about some of the families. Do you come in contact with their families at all, or is it mainly with the prisoner themselves? We have uh, we have a little bit. When we have the baptism for uh, for our new converts, uh, we facilitate the movement of, of their families and have met families. We had one here just uh, back in November where I talked to the woman that, fortunately, she couldn't make it uh, because of physical problems. But I've talked to the families, and they're very uh, supportive of us, naturally, that we're there for them. And, we're, and some of them don't get to, and they don't have no contact visits there. They have to be behind a plexiglass. So touch is a very important thing to them. I've had people there where they said they haven't had a handshake of peace for five years. Nobody has touched them in a manner that, a friendly manner. So touch is very important. That's one thing I've learned since I've been at the ministry okay. there. Touch is very important to the human being. The folks that are with us that might want to get involved in prison ministry, what do they do? Who do they call? What is all involved in kind of that type of ministry? Well, I think the best procedure would be to get a hold of Mike O'Brien at the uh, Catholic Diocese of Youngstowns. He's in charge of the ministry for all the facilities we have. That would be the best contact. He's with Catholic Charities there. He'd be happy to talk to and give you a feel for our prison. And then, of course, we would be involved, too, if you want to go to Ohio Penitentiary, for example, which is here on, in Youngstown. We'd be involved in the vetting and, and, and talking to you about that. There is training for the state facilities. There is training, uh, six-hour training that we go through for a facility like that. So there's a little bit of training involved from our side, the spiritual side, but also from the state of Ohio side. And, <clears throat> yeah, and I would imagine that in order to get into the facility, I know when I visited those who've been incarcerated, you need to go through a process in order to do that. Oh, you absolutely. just can't go up to the door, oh, knock on and walk in. <laughs> absolutely. So there is a process. So we absolutely. do encourage those who are interested to do contact Mike, but to know that it's not something you're going to, it's going to happen overnight. It does no, take a little time. No, it's going to be a little bit of a process with Mike vetting and Mike and then also there's a paperwork we have to go through for the state. It has to be vet. The state has to vet you before you can go in there. And naturally, if you have somebody that's housed there, discourage that. You can't minister if you have somebody that's inmate there. We have uh, one minute left. So yeah. in this one minute, Tom, what would you say is your greatest blessing that you have because you've been involved in this prison ministry? Well, when you come in there, Father, in the, in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, and you go to the cell door and, you're, and you have a little window, you look in there. Then they're waiting for you, and they have a smile on their face. What a blessing that is. Being in there 23 and a half hours a day, they're looking for the Eucharist. They're looking for Christ. They're all searching for somebody. And when you see that smile on their face, it makes your day. It doesn't get any better than that, really. Well, Tom Renicki, we thank you so much for your presence here on Wineskins, but also for your ministry in the prison system and for those many people throughout our diocese who are involved, priests, deacon laypersons. We want to thank them for that ministry and also encourage those that are with us, if they're interested in prison ministry in any way, to please contact the diocese to see how they can help. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Father. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. For more information on that current issue and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hello, I am Bishop George Murray of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. During this holy season of Easter, we recall the presence of the risen Lord among us. Over 2,000 years ago, he told his disciples, Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of time. As we celebrate his resurrection, may his gifts of love and joy fill your hearts and homes this Easter season. The song we have for you today is from the CD called Spirit and Soul. It is by Valimar Jansen, 
and is compliments of Oregon Catholic Press. You can visit their website at www.ocp.org. Behold the wood that bears our name. Behold the nails that hold our sin. The tree from which salvation blooms. The death by which we're born again. We take up our cross and follow him. We lay down our lives that we might live. We carry the hope of Christ within. We take up our cross and follow him. We embrace the sacrifice and walk the path we cannot see. The burdens of this world made light. By blood and thorn we are redeemed. We take up our cross and follow That we might live We carry the hope of Christ within We take up our cross and follow Him Lift Him high, lift Him high Let His name be glorified And to tell us about the scripture for this second Sunday of Easter and Sunday of Divine Mercy is Father Tom Dyer. He is president of St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Louisville and administrator of St. Anne Church in Sebring. And so we find ourselves here today celebrating Mercy Sunday in the year of mercy, hoping for a lifetime of mercy both received and given. The four Sundays of April have a a stream of thought from St. Luke's Acts of the Apostles, from the book of Revelation, and from the Gospel of John. Perhaps as we read all three readings, we need to have in our minds and hearts the psalm response. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love is everlasting. His love is everlasting. Divine mercy flows from each of our readings. Today in the Acts of the Apostles, we see the mercy of God among the signs and wonders and admit the fears and the tensions. Yet, great things were happening. Many people were being added. Peter acted decisively 
and all were cured. John's purpose in the gospel is to shout, Jesus lives, and all must know it. Jesus presents himself through a locked door. He brings peace, as did God to Adam. Jesus breathes on the apostles. He breathes in them a new creation and gives them the power and the mercy to forgive sins bestowed on them by the Holy Spirit. Thomas, like all of us, were not present at the time, but a week later he was. Again, a locked door, a greeting of peace, and to Thomas, come, look, feel, move from unbelief to belief. And Thomas utters, my Lord and my God. Hear well the blessing of Jesus to all of us. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. And then here as well. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. So finally then today, let's look at the book of Revelation. We will read for the next five weeks from this book. This genre of apocalyptic, it presents to us a book of hope during a time of stress. John the seer, we know not more of him, used signs and symbols and colors and animals in the form of a resolution, almost a revolt that really comes to us as a reflection upon the signs of the times. This, my friends, is the beginning of our time after Easter as we look into the scriptures and as we draw the scriptures into ourselves that we might live having heard and having been brought to belief. For Wineskins, I'm Father Tom Dyer. What kind of God is it who can play with children and weep with his friends, and who can love without being loved, and who reaches out to the world with nail-scarred hands? It is a great mystery, but if we want to know God, we can see him most clearly in Jesus Christ. Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda saying thank you for being with us. Have a blessed week.